Good morning, everybody. My name is Fabian Levy, and I serve as Deputy Mayor for Communications for the City of New York. Thank you all for joining us today. Last night, we lost one of New York's finest. The mayor talked about it last night, but during one of our first weeks in office, every single night an officer was shot, and that week ended with a double murder of de detectives Rivera and Mora, two young men who wanted to serve their city and help their fellow New Yorkers. The same was true about Officer Jonathan Diller, who dedicated his life to the protecting the city and keeping his fellow New Yorkers safe. Our thoughts and prayers are with Jonathan's loved ones today. So before we begin, I'd like you to all join me in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Every day our administration is working to deliver a safer, stronger New York City. That work takes all of us, which is why the mayor has once again convened leaders from across city government to answer your questions and address important issues. So joining us today, we have Mayor Eric Adams, First Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright, Chief Advisor to the Mayor Ingrid Lewis Martin, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services Ann Williams Isom, Deputy Mayor for Operations Mayor Joshi, Deputy Mayor for Strategic Initiatives Anna Almanzar, Chief Counsel Lisa Zornberg, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs Tiffany Raspberry, and New York City Corporation Counsel Sylvia Hines Radix. So without further delay, I'm pleased to turn it over to Mayor Adams. Uh, thank you, uh, Fabian. Uh, last night <clears throat> uh, at the shooting, I intentionally uh, used the name Jonathan because sometimes when we use our titles, we get lost in just the everyday humanistic a part of this. When I, when I went to the hospital and was in a room with his wife and the family members, you know, I saw Sandra, Conrad, Leroy, uh, Bernard, uh, Faye. I saw my siblings. And I used to always wonder as a police officer, uh, the moment that if something were to happen to Bernard or to me, how we would gather in that room. And I would think about uh, uh, Glenn, uh, Ingrid's husband, who was involved in the shooting while we were in the police academy when someone tried to rob him. Like, how do you knock on the doors? How do you tell a family member? And what do you say? The awkwardness of having to sit in that room and explain to them as they were still working on his heart, massaging it, uh, that, you know, there was a possibility we would have to come back and say Jonathan was gone. And that's exactly what happened. And Jonathan is just a symbol of those of you who have children. Imagine, you know, just the pain of that, of, of going through something that's unnatural. Parents should never have to bury their children. There's nothing natural about that. And watching his wife as she's just holding on, just, you know, hoping not to hear those words come back. It was just a senseless act of violence. And in this city, uh, we have uh, three problems that is really at the core. Uh, one is uh, the recidivist problem. We have a real recidivist problem. Uh, these uh, two individuals, uh, one of the men, uh, uh, had been arrested on a gun charge in April 2023, the driver. He has more than 20 priors. Uh, the other has an equal amount of priors. Recidivism is a real issue. And the second issue that we have in this city is a severe mental health illness problem that was played out on 125th Street and Lexington Avenue at the subway station. Uh, and he was a recidivist. Several mental health, severe mental health issues, uh, indicators of violence. And when you do an analysis and a cross correlation, you will see it's the same people over and over again. We showed you with 38 people arrested with over 1,100 uh, incidents in the subway system, 38 people arrested for assaulting uh, transit authority employees. And so when you com combine the recidivism 
with severe mental health illness, 50% of the people at Rikers Island are dealing with mental health issues, and 18% are severe. And then you add the random acts of violence to that. All of them played out last night. Pushing someone on the subway track, random act of violence, a recidivist shooting an innocent person, a person with severe mental health illness, you do an analysis of all of these reporting that you're doing, and you're going to keep coming up with the same three items. Severe mental health, random act of violence, recidivism, over and over again. And what's interesting is that our practices, laws, and policies are not going after those three issues. We're up in Albany right now fighting to put teeth to the Kendra's Law so we can institute a process of removing those who are in danger to themselves and others. We've been talking about the severe uh, recidivism of dangerous people over and over again on how do we stop them from coming into our streets. There's a total disregard. They, they could care less when they discharge that gun if they shot a cop or if they shot someone that was at Sabina Brooks Powers' office, who was the council person, that it happens right near her office. Just a total disregard. These are bad people who are doing bad things to good people. This It's the good guys against the bad guys, and we have to recognize that. And then when we highlight these severe acts of violence on social media, these random acts of violence, it just makes people afraid spoke to someone on the subway system the other day, and they said, we have to be having at least four or 500 crimes on our subway system a day. This is how people believe. And then we hear this over and over again. The city's out of control. The city's out of control. The city's out of control. It's just not true. That's why we keep saying crime is down, jobs are up. That's why we keep talking about 50% of city residents, 4 million riders a day on our subway system. Because we have to push back on this narrative that we're living in a city that's out of control. I know a city out of control because I visit some of them in this country. This is not one of them. Our focus must be this. Recidivism, severe mental health illness, random acts of violence. That is the mission. And those are the policies this administration we have put in place. But we need help. Our police officers can't do this on their own. They've been doing an admirable job. And let me tell you something, folks. We're losing correction officers. They're getting ready to retire and age out. And no one is meeting the classes. We're losing police officers. We're losing district attorneys because district attorneys are overwhelmed with paperwork right now. And we're losing them. Go talk to your DAs. We're losing probation officers. We're losing parole officers. The foundation of the public safety apparatus is dissolving right in front of our eyes. And if we don't get in front of it, we are going to be dealing with a severe public safety crisis that other cities are experiencing. That is the concern. That's the clarion call that we must put out. And losing Jonathan, it hurts a lot. I remember sending the hospitals in the beginning of this term and standing over those hospital beds and sitting inside that vehicle after leaving there, trying to just figure out when am I going to have to say at the funeral? What am I going to say to this family? What am, what am I going to say to New Yorkers? And we've done a lot. We've come a long way. But we have a long way to go. But we have to deal with these small pocket of people that have made up their mind they're going to hurt New Yorkers. And I made up my mind I'm not going to allow them to do it. And that's what this administration, this police department, and that's what this team wants to do. As we move to answer questions, I want, just want to add, as we ensure families are being safe in the city and get to school every day, we need to deal with our housing crisis. 1.4% vacancy rate, uh, Ingrid and uh, 
uh, Tiffany and Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer. We were up in Albany this week uh, speaking with our lawmakers. Uh, we signed uh, yesterday intro 653-A, recognizing the housing emergency that we have. We cannot leave this legislative session without coming up with a real housing plan. You, we almost have a 0% vacancy rate for a uh, low income. It's a, it's a real challenge, and we can't talk our way out of, out of it. We have to legislate our way out of it. And that's why, in partnership with the faith leaders across the city, we're advancing a bold, forward-thinking housing plan that says yes in my backyard, uh, you, yes to a little more housing throughout our entire city and every neighborhood. And our city of yes for housing opportunity is our plan to do just that. It's a mission-driven, faith-based, and community organizations can play a special role in building more housing. And our faith-based communities, they want, to, they want to do it. They have air rights, they have vacant lots, uh, they could do necessary conversions. There's so much more we can do uh, to house people. And the largest advocates against housing are those who have housing. People say over and over again, uh, let's build more housing, but not in my backyard. And I want to take my hat off to Julie Minney, who built one of the first uh, mandatory inclusionary housing in her councilmatic district, leading from the front. Hats off to the speaker of the city council, Adrian Adams, who's looking at the aqueduct project in her district, who's stepping up and saying, we need to be about allowing people to live in housing. There's no future of growing up in a homeless shelter. We want to grow up in housing. And finally, uh, as we ensure New Yorkers have a place to live, uh, and can safely get to work and home safely, we must also make sure New Yorkers are able to have a family. This is a real issue that Deputy Mayor uh, uh, williams Ison has been talking about, and it's something that it was important to me when I was Brooklyn Borough President. Uh, we want to ensure that women, women who give birth can have a healthy outcome. And last November, we laid out bold plans in Healthy NYC to reduce black maternity mortality by 10% and reduce overdose, overdose deaths by 25% by 2030. In January, we took the next step with our Women Forward NYC plan, our initiative with the ambitious goal of making New York the most women forward city in the nation. And this morning, we announced another major step, an $8 million health and substance use disorder clinic for pregnant and postpartum women and their families. Uh, we must all be invested in supporting pregnant women, and it doesn't mean up until birth, it means after birth as well. The clinic will provide 200 families per year with a safe and supportive place to access prenatal and postnatal care, addiction medicine, and behavior health care. It will support healthy birth outcomes, reduce the likelihood and impact of postpartum relapse, and address the needs of older children living in these families. And it will help connect parents to community-based organizations who can help find jobs, housing, and food. Because uh, we're talking about parents, and I remember not even aware of this, but when Jordan was born, uh, those first few months of what his mom went through and how didn't even realize the depression that has settled in and what she was feeling. And this also is always dismissive, you know, of just get up, get over it, when in fact there's real science and research that we're going to acknowledge and do everything that's possible to slow this terrible, terrible uh, outcome that too many women are experiencing in general, but specifically black and brown women. I cannot help to believe that if all women were experiencing what black and brown women are experiencing after birth, we would not have a national emergency. We have ignored this for far too long, and we are not going to ignore it at this administration. Tough issues that we're going to take to come up with real solutions that we're facing. Faith, yeah? Okay, take some questions. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask you about 719 civil lawsuits that were filed by women prisoners or have people have been in prison in Rikers Island. They're charging all kinds of things from late night sex assaults to um, being 
subjected to rape, having pregnancies because of this, and all kinds of other things. I wonder what your reaction is, and the fact that they're seeking $14.7 billion, which is three times what you spent on the migrant crisis. We, I, I just uh, became aware of that, uh, the report I read it today. Uh, we're going to dig into it, and it must be a thorough investigation on exactly um, what the allegations are. and we will look into exactly what took place. This is the first time I became aware of it. What makes you think that this is going to affect your court suit in trying to prevent a federal monitor from being appointed and this will convince the judge that maybe some outside um, monitor should be put in place? Or will you argue that because it goes back decades, it wasn't something that came under your watch? Yeah, and I'm glad you pointed that out because I was going to do the same, that this was going back decades. Uh, and uh, if you look at some of the federal cases, federal prisons, uh, there were, there's a case that come to mind right away of a young girl who uh, had an incident inside one of the federal jails. Um, abuse in, in jails, period, is not something that's new, but when you see it, you must address, address it and face it, and that is what we're going to do. Sorry, we had a little I'm sorry. Were you shocked by these revelations? Oh, uh, yes. But I, I believe that we need to have a complete investigation to determine the outcome of it. Yes. And, and Mr. <coughs> I, I yes. Mm -hmm. very, these are very sensitive issues, and the law department is working with the Department of Corrections in order um, to deal with the issues that we have here. Uh, so the city, the city has absolutely no tolerance for, for it any kind of these incidents, and so we are uh, working on them. Yes. Um, you talk about recidivism and recidivism, and are Stop. you... Oh, it's the mic's getting that up. Sorry. It's the Are Are you aware of anything that's being done in Albany that would either review or change some of the crimes that are now not eligible for bail? And if, if no change is happening there, how are you addressing recidivists and their crimes here? And, and, and you know, the term bail has become a popular term, but it's more, it's more than just bail. Uh, we, we have to properly fund uh, discovery rules. The district attorneys are saying what many people are not uh, realizing that there are a large number of cases that are being dropped and dismissed. That's the analysis we need to look at because they cannot turn over the, the discovery fast enough. And so there's some serious cases that they're not prosecuted. And that, that number, people, we need to look at that and see how does it impact and how does it connect the dot with the recidivism. You caught with a gun, you don't get the discovery in time, you're back on the streets, and you were in possession of another gun. The driver of this car got arrested with a gun less than a year ago. He's back in an incident that's involving the gun again. And so it is about a real analysis of what is feeding our recidivism crisis. It's everything from discovery to are we looking at repeat offenders and all of those items we should, we should be examining. So it's not a one item problem. Up. I know you're putting more cops into transit. Um, when I went out with the chiefs the other day, a, a woman <coughs> of color said uh, to uh, Deputy Commissioner Daughtry, she says, I think there should be more undercover cops here because, quite frankly, I get intimidated by the uniform. What do you think of that? And, and I'm glad you said that because I must have said this a million times. You have 8.3 million people, 35 million opinions. I don't care if you, some people say, why don't, why don't we put National Guards um, throughout Utica Avenue, Franklin Avenue, because we get just that. And we do have a substantial number of undercover police officers that are there that are playing a major role that's dealing with our grand larcenies and our pickpockets and looking after those criminal behavior. The other day at 125th Street and Lexington Avenue, do you know we had six cops there? Six cops, platform, token booth, they were, they were present. Mm. But when you're dealing with a mental health, severe mental health crisis, or if you want to participate in criminal behavior, we have now reached a point 
where there are those who are so emboldened by that they can keep doing their actions, that uniform no longer means anything. We had a shooting over the weekend. The cop is on the north side of the street. The shooting took on place on the south side of the street. The officer was right there. Bad guys no longer fear the police. They feel emboldened to do whatever they want. On <clears throat> Mayor, on you? the issue of, I'm good, thanks, how are you? Good. On the issue of debit cards being issued to the migrants, you have talked before about how a few months ago, the word at the border was, come to New York, you get a room, they'll give you the Roosevelt, you're gonna be well treated, and then you spent time, even when you traveled there, trying to dissuade people from coming to New York. You've also changed the length of time that you want folks to stay down to 30. Doesn't the debit card sort of send a mixed message because word will spread back at the border? Go to New York, you'll get a debit card, you can buy food, you can take care, care of your family. It seems like a new appealing reason to come here. No, it sends a mixed message when it's distorted. We were my team, I gave them a clear directive, bring down the cost by 30%, 30%, and we're moving in that direction. And whatever it takes within the Lord to do so, we have to do it. And we can't be afraid of people criticizing success. We're going to save $600 million a month. 600,000. 600,000. $600,000 600, a month. Thank you. <laughs> seven, over $7 million a year. So should we say, and we're going to do away with food waste, and we're going to put money back into the local economy, and we're going to MWBE. So now do we say, let's not do it because people are going to cr critique us? If, if we didn't do things because people were going to critique us, we would not have gotten thousands of people off our street that are homeless. We would have not removed our encampments. We would have not taken thousands of guns off the street. We got to do it right. But yes. It's not about the critique. It's mm -hmm. about how do you combat the idea that the word gets back to the border that basically free money is available to families to, to get things that they don't have right now. That, how concerned are you about that? Just as when you expanded the shelters, the word spread at the border, come to New York, you get a room. Again, I cannot say it any clearer. Anytime you move from a good faith and do what is a humanitarian crisis with over 180,000 people, you. Uh, you have to take necessary steps. And so when people tweet back or uh, Facebook back to their loved ones in Ecuador or any other place and state that, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a hurt. Because believe it or not, even sleeping on a cot to many people is better than sleeping in the Darien Gap. And so that's going to go back. So we have to find the right combination, delivery of services with the same level of dignity and do it in a way that's cost effective. And I'm not hearing from my colleagues down in um, Ecuador, Colombia, um, Mexico, that, hey, everybody's running to New York because they're going to get a food card. I'm not hearing that. You know, that's not what I'm hearing from down there. I, I, would, I would just also add in, uh, Sift, that the mayor was very clear last year. We gave out uh, flyers at the border reminding folks that there's not unlimited, you know, free hotels and stuff like that. We are updating those flyers, making that very clear. And the mayor can be, it was just very clear, we'll all be very clear, there is no free money. These are not ATM cards. You can't take cash out. If anyone has that idea, they are wrong. This is for food and baby supplies only. And I know you're not trying to blame New York City, right? You are reinforcing us when we do good work. We are doing really good work when we have 60% of the people that are moving on. We don't control how people get here. And so more support from the federal government to help with the coordination down at the border so people could go where they need to would be helpful. So I want us to keep focused on that, not a small pilot for 500 families that's gonna save us money. I think we're doing a really good job under really challenging circumstances. Can you elaborate on the chronology of what happened in yesterday's shooting? How did the uh, police officers asking these two guys to move on from the bus stop escalate to them being asked to get out of the car? to them refusing to get out of the car. And then second, can you talk about the officer's family, I understand he has a child, um, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to be extremely uh, restrained in talking about the families, give them a, a right to privacy. 
and the NYPD still conducted their investigation of the escalation. But I will tell you this, um, being in situations of taking police actions, um, things escalate quickly. And, you know, we can sit back and look at a tape and analyze it, all that's well, but when you're in the, on the front line and you are dealing with someone that you're seeing that they're not uh, obeying your basic uh, law, uh, lawful order, things start to kick in. And there was uh, one thing that I heard on that video, what I saw that uh, many people take offense to, but that officer turned out to be right. He told the person, take your hands out your pockets. We say that often. People think it's offensive, but there's a reason for that. And that officer turned out to be right when he said, take your hands out, out of your pockets. And the investigation is going to unfold, and I'm sure the police department is going to uh, give you the, what led up to what, uh, what, what took place uh, to escalate it. But there's one thing that's clear. The person who shot the officer did not have the right to have the gun, did not have the right to shoot anyone. And that is what my focus is, and he is, he's a recidivist. The, the police department would give you the, uh, the uh, complete breakdown of the family. I want to respect the family's privacy at this time. Mr. Mayor, I welcome any details or information about your recent planned trip to visit the border. Mm -hmm. um, where you have to, been, visit. to visit the southern border. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, who had invited you? What did they want you to see? Where you were headed? Who you wanted to go with? Mm -hmm. What the State Department said was dangerous about the situation? What led you to cancel, please? We, uh, we, we uh, uh, Sister Norma came up here with a delegation. Uh, she's a national leader. She's executive director of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande, and just a global recognized humanitarian. You know, everyone we talked to said that she's a person to communicate. And what's very interesting, when Deputy Mayor uh, Amazar uh, put this together, there was, we put the meeting that we had at Gracie okay. Mansion and the tour that she did, there was a reluctancy to come here to the city to see me because they figured that, you know, we, this was an anti-immigrant feeling. Uh, and when they came here, did a walkthrough, we had um, a meeting at Gracie Mansion, uh, Sister Norma. Uh, first of all, there was a real connection uh, between the two of us, and she invited me down to see what they were doing, and all of them said, it is unbelievable what you're doing in New York City. You have led the nation in calling on those issues that are important, such as work authorization, and uh, they wanted us to come down and see what they're doing and, and, and encourage people to come and continue to see what we're doing here. We were planning to go down. Our tickets were ready to go, uh, as we always do. Uh, Inspector uh, uh, Melody, who's in charge of my detail, uh, reached out to me late that, that night. I think it was either Thursday night or Friday, Friday. in the day, one Friday, night. Friday night. And she says, uh, Eric, the State Department is concerned about this trip. Uh, one of the cities and the areas you're going to be in um, there's, a, there's a real issue there around security, and actually there's the mayor of one yeah. of the cit cities is, is, you know, there are threats made against him, and we could not get the same fortification that we got when we went to Ecuador and when we went to uh, Colombia. We were fortified, we had the right security in place, there was a lot of planning. So this was new to us, we wanted to make the right decision because um, I'm not going to put my team in, in harm's way, and we could not put that in place in a small amount of time because the notification came later. So the invite came from Sister Norma. Um, the, the pause of the trip, pause, because we will be going. The pause came from information from the State Department, and my security detail and in intel stated that, uh, you know, it, it would not be a responsible action on your part to bring a delegation down with the threats that we got from the State Department. And now, Emily? State Department, State Department, there have been times I wanted to travel somewhere and the State Department has reached out and stated, 
of you know you should not you should not you should not go going all the way back to when I was a police officer um, going to Moscow um, that was during the time when Yeltsin was losing power the State Department reached out and said we have questions about this trip so I respect the State Department's in town and that's why we made the decision so Emily I just want to add that I met sister Norma Pimentel probably about two months ago at Fordham when I was invited to come and talk about the work that New York City was doing. And I was very nervous to be on a panel with this nationally um, renowned, um, I feel like she's a saint, right? And I <laughs> went to Catholic schools my whole life, so I was very anxious about what she was going to say. When she heard about the work that we were doing, about the amount of people that we that have come here, she was she was very surprised. She told me at the time when when I was asking her for advice, that we shouldn't keep on saying, why is this happening? What more can we do? We should wake up every morning um, and ask ourselves what more we can be doing. And then she told me I should be going to bed every night exhausted from doing good. And so I was like, damn, okay, sounds like what the nuns have been telling me my whole life. But it also gave me sort of the focus on that this is not an easy situation, but we're doing the best that we can. So when she said she wanted to come and visit and we got to take her to see some of the work that we are doing, I was very proud of what the comments that she had and that she now wants to make sure that she can send some people back to New York City to get trained at the legal clinic and to see the work that we're doing. So um, she's a very special person who also has been um, recognized by the Pope for the work that she's been doing at the border. And, and you missed and an important part, what she shared with you. She adored me. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> she did, she did. I was about she to adored the mayor. Uh, true. No, but true she, story. That, that's true. She, uh, she did speak about um, the, the human side that she got to see about Mayor Adams and the administration, and that's why she invited us over, so we can continue to see the humanitarian aspect of this crisis. She uh, was very sad. Um, when we when we had to let her know that we couldn't make it, it was a, a, a day of um, uh, thoughtful planning. Uh, and the idea was spending Palm Sunday with a nun that I consider I'm going to start naming her uh, the modern Mother Cabrini, uh, the modern state of all immigrants, and uh, in the work that she's doing there, that she would like to see us come down so she can learn more for what New York City is doing. And as she said, she was proud to come and, and meet Mayor Adams in person. So yes, she loves you, Mayor Adams. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was a city that I, I didn't even realize that they had a problem. What was the name of the city? Definitely, man, I was looking. Reynosa. 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 And, and it was, it, that city is going through some serious um, uh, violence right now with gangs. And uh, we wanted, we wish we had time to shift things around. Uh, but it's the timing was not there and, uh, and, and the detail my detail leader just said we're not gonna be able to duplicate what we did we had real security when we were in uh, Ecuador and in Colombia and they said it's, we just don't have time to do it uh, on Staten Island NYCHA residents at the Stapleton houses last week saw sporadic power outages sometimes during uh, sub freezing temperatures you know this is the same development that had a building in the complex without cooking gas for close to a year last year i just wanted to get a sense what your administration is doing to address quality of life concerns for residents there and when they should expect more long-term improvements for their development you know nitra has a i think an 80 billion dollar capital need yeah. capital needs 80 billion dollars and, you know, people sat on their hands for a long time. You know, as I say, saying the cavalry is coming, the cavalry is coming. Those bugles are taps. <laughs> NYCHA was dying. And we stepped in uh, and did uh, the NYCHA Land Trust, uh, which many people tried, couldn't accomplish, but we got it done. You know, the lobbying that uh, Ingrid and Tiffany did in Albany with Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer, we were able to land that plane. Uh, not only are we looking at the short term, such as um, free broadband for NYCHA, looking at the Chelsea project of uh, building new on NYCHA. Uh, NYCHA has been ignored for so many years. And when uh, Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer put it in our housing plan as one of the top issues, we were clear that we were not going to ignore NYCHA. We know it's a Herculean task, but we were not going to ignore it. And when I spoke with uh, First Deputy Mayor Wright over the weekend, 
when this came on my radar, she immediately r reached out to find out what the heck was going on over there uh, to get the issue resolved. So you probably want to go sure. take it from there. And also certainly want to acknowledge Jessica Katz, our chief housing officer, um, who has you know helped us prioritize NYCHA. So the weekend's uh, event was due to Con Ed. Uh, and it was a con ed issue where the power had kind of come off the grid. And so the NYCHA team and staff were working around the clock to make sure that that got resolved and it did get resolved. And certainly they kept us updated. And we also uh, kind of reached out to our colleagues at con ed to make sure that that got resolved. But as the mayor said, NYCHA, um, this is an administration that has put NYCHA uh, as a key priority, a key priority in terms of everything from livability, quality of life, uh, new construction, new housing opportunities, and, and it's something we will continue to do. subway to shelter since you undertook that big push in February 2022 and how many have thereafter remained in shelter and then secondly about Tim Pearson I'm wondering what it is about him that he can quietly be earning two salaries and a pension get into a brawl at a migrant shelter spark a major sexual harassment suit and still not suffer any professional consequences yeah um the uh the first of uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Williams I assume you want to go over the, um, the question, but let me tell you about uh, the, um, I'm just gonna say this about the, the Tim Pearson issue that you said. In this country, there's something called due process. And that due process does not change. It's due process, that's the cornerstone of our country. That is what Tim Pearson did for a great deal of time, ensure people had due process. And as a person, who was in the Trade Center when the buildings collapsed and saved a great deal of people in guiding them out and protecting the city for the amount of time he has, I think he is due due process. Uh, uh, DM Isom? Oh, yes, you're, um, so the number is, since the launch of the subway safety plan in February, nearly 7,000 New Yorkers have checked into shelter. The tricky part about that is how many of them stay into shelter and how many of them then come back again. So really focusing on that discharge planning, how people get the help that they need, I think it's something that we want to concentrate on. I also want to really mention that a 1,000 people were placed into permanent housing from safe havens and stabilization beds. I was just talking to Commissioner Park about that this morning, and over 90% of them are still in stabilized housing. We've also, as you know, increased 60% uh, increase in outreach staff since January of 2022 so we're there we're engaging people we're getting people connected to shelter it's this concept of keeping them in shelter long enough getting them the support that they need so that they're not spiraling in and out of the system and I don't think people really respect how challenged the severe mental health population is if you have not been on the system if you have not engaged them on the streets um, back in January and February of 2022, when I first got elected, uh, in some of those tents and in some of those encampments, and you speaking with people and seeing the conditions they're living on, and then building the trust enough, I mean, the length of time you need to have people just being willing to talk to you. And so when you look at the numbers that uh, DM williams Isom just indicated, uh, when you're out there every day talking to the same people, trying to convince them. When you're dealing with that severe mental health population, it is not just going to someone who just had a bad day and saying uh, that, hey, would you go for help? This is a very challenging population to give them the help that they need. And our numbers are showing that we're willing to take on this. Many people walk past us and ignore this. You know, you had a lot of encampments in the city. People ignored this, you know, prior to January 2022. And many people told me, Eric, this is suicidal. Why are you even taking this on? There's other problems in the city. Because... Just I'm not going to ignore people living on our streets. I'm sorry. I just want to also clarify, and the mayor reminds us of this all the time. There's severe mental um, illness, and people who are getting treatment 
are fine and are able to do very well. We're really talking about people who have severe mental health illness and who are untreated. Many who have been untreated for a long period of time and don't even realize anymore that they have a severe mental right. illness. So just to clarify. Right. Uh, How are you, JR? I am well. Good afternoon, team. Uh, my first question was about mental health, but you covered that across mm -hmm. the board because after that incident uh, last night where that man was pushed onto the tracks, uh, I figured it has something to do with mental health. But the second question is off topic. Uh, were you able to talk to the mayor of Baltimore after that uh, bridge collapse? My daughter goes to Howard, so you know, that was, that was quite concerning. Uh, this morning on our 8 a.m., uh, I told uh, 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 Deputy Mayor Molina um, uh, to uh, reach out, find out what we could do uh, uh, to find out how we could help. And so we want to make sure, and uh, we have a call in with the, the mayor there, we want to make sure that we help any way we can. And, and Mayor, I reached out to the mayor and the city council president as well. Can I also just note our own bridge infrastructure is some of the most highly monitored infrastructure in the nation. Um, so that, and also the coordination with vessels and our bridge communication is highly sophisticated. Um, our thoughts are with the workers that were on those bridges. That's one of the dangers, that's a dangerous job to begin with. An, ev an event like that is completely unforeseen when people wake up and go to work knowing they have a dangerous job. Um, so we certainly, are, our hearts are with them, um, but we want New Yorkers to rest assured that the right precautions are in place to ensure that our infrastructure is safe and remains safe and how it interacts with both trucks and ships that both hit bridges occasionally. Um, we have the right protections in place. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Um, so I wanted to touch on two things. One is to go back to, to Tim Pearson and the other has to do with the story we, we ran about uh, Ezra Friedlander yeah. and his mm -hmm. meeting in, in May. So on Pearson, have you spoken to him about the, the allegations in the lawsuit? Um, I mean, do you believe what was alleged? Is there anything to lead, lead you to believe that what's in there might be some truth to? And I think I know the answer to this, but will he be suspended? Will he be represented by a city lawyer in that? As far as Friedlander, Friedlander, um, he told me that, that city officials in his meeting in May 21st of last year raised the, the issue of restoring flights uh, between New York and, and Baku. Mm -hmm. did, did, and I understand from I've been told you weren't in this meeting, but maybe somebody else can help answer this. The Turkish Airlines come up in that conversation and also, you know, why would why would city officials bring that up if it's I mean to me it seems like outside of the city's purview. So like if there's anything you could kind of expand on with that, I'd appreciate it. Well um, again, uh, the we had, our IG, uh, in, I, I, IA, International Affairs uh, Group, if you come here, or if you monitor our, our Twitter, or if you look at the meetings we have, we probably have more international leaders than any other administration in its history. Uh, people come to New York, particularly during UNGA, you were in General Assembly, and they reach out. We have to turn that down rural leaders, because our schedule can't keep up with it. People see us as an international city, and I believe that. And we have international input. People look at us as global leaders. The UN is here, <laughs> you know, the UN is here. Council generals, we had the council generals of all these different regions from South America, Central America, from, I think we're meeting with the council generals, uh, we meet, meeting with a Mexican constituent. You know, so that was the charge I gave uh, Ed Mermerstein, the commissioner there, that let's live up to our title of an international leader. And when people come here with various issues, we add our voices to it. I don't know what would happen uh, in the meeting. Um, uh, Ed Mermerstein is going to follow whatever rules there were. They, they, I think what, what you raised in your article was that um, he would, um, 
Ezra was supposed to report this to someone. That wasn't our obligation. We didn't violate any reporting procedures. We meet with international leaders, share our thoughts, learn how we can get their businesses here, learn how we continue to build our international uh, re relationships. And so um, it is imperative that uh, we you know, make sure that those who come here, they follow their procedures because we're gonna follow our procedures. And if they talked about the Baku uh, and increasing flights, if there's a way we can add a letter, we want flights to come here. We want as many flights as possible to come to JFK. More tourists that's come here, they will add to the 62 million that we had last year. We would like to have 100 million. They bring money, they leave money, they spend money, uh, and we want them to continue to, to do so. So I'm not sure why that meeting became just, you know, clandestine, you know, secret spy sort of stuff. It, we met with an international leader. We do it all the time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure, when I read the story, I, I, I had a flashback from my childhood. I said, where's the beef? <laughs> I mean, what was wrong? What did we do wrong? What did this administration do wrong? He should have reported it if he didn't. But I'm lost on what we did wrong. Hello. How are you doing? Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I'm good. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of today's uh, press conference, yes. the recidivism. It's, I see how close it is to your heart, emotional moment for the New Yorkers. But what are the solutions? Because you mentioned the question was here already, and you mentioned analysis of discovery process. But is there any concrete solutions that you can assure New Yorkers on taking these steps? Are you going to push for any reform like you did with sanctuary law? We, we are in constant communication, and my dialogue has not changed since the day I was elected. We should never be focusing draconian sentencing on those who commit minor infractions. But those repeated offenders, which is a national problem, when I talk to my colleagues across the country, they talk about the repeated offenders. There's a small number of people who are repeated offenders, and I'm hoping that our lawmakers, that we focus on that body of people, and I'm hoping that our judges focus on it. It is obvious, we see the cop. We see the mayor, but there are other folks who are part of the criminal justice system that we don't see that are making major decisions that impact our uh, law enforcement. And how are you going to impact that? Is there any way you can do I can only keep, I can only do within this, my span of control, educate the public, uh, continue to visit Albany, engage in conversations, speak with the city council members, uh, speak with my district attorneys and advocate that our judges, particularly with those who we appoint, understand how important it is to keep dangerous people off our streets. And Deputy Mayor, Mayor Williams, I see Oh, yeah, you. no, and Mayor Adams, don't forget that you're supporting the Supportive Interventions Act on severe mental illness and sort of how important that is to make the changes that we need to um, involuntary removals, making sure that doctors have the comprehensive information that they need in order to be able to make determinations, um, uh, making it more expansive around who can do an uh, evaluation. And then sometimes when people come into the emergency room, we can only use the records of that particular interaction, not the fact that that particular person might have been there three times before. So there's some real common sense on um, parts of this legislation that we think is very important and that will have a real impact on what we're seeing happen. Uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, first one, uh, following up on what uh, Michael tried to ask, uh, just whether or not Pearson gets corporate counsel representation, I assume he does because I guess you're going to consider that to be part of his duties. But I would point out that the general municipal law also has a uh, clause in it that says that if the actions taken were in violation of the regulations, then they can't be represented by the city. And that also applies, well, I mean, but on Pearson, go ahead. We're, we're very much aware of what general municipal law says. And this is a new case it, with multiple individuals and, and different entities. Uh, and you are aware of, uh, that uh, from general municipal law that we have to conduct representation interviews. Uh, those um, interviews will be conducted and we will make a determination when they are concluded. Yes. Okay, my second question is, 
Yeah, I'll let him finish. Let him, let him go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. They, you referenced, I think, Stapleton houses. Yes, I mean, this stuff, this goes on all over the place. I mean, this is not, these are like one-off things. They happen all the time. Mm -hmm. The monitor um, issued his final report mm -hmm. last week. I don't know if anybody, any of you guys read that thing. Uh, he was really laying into the hierarchy. Uh, and that includes people that you appoint to the board and the chair. And he was specifically saying they're not really serious about doing their jobs. And he was talking about how they formed committees that never met. And he was suggesting, a very specific suggestion, which is make the chair a full-time job that's salaried, because right now it's a volunteer one. What, what's your, first of all, what's your take on his report, if you've seen it? And then number two, what do you think about that concept? Uh, first of all, um, uh, I'm gonna let Deputy Mayor First Deputy Mayor uh, Wright talk about that, but I would say to the uh, monitor or whoever did the report, who's made millions of dollars of doing so, where were you? Where were you all this time? You know, uh, he's been there for years. The problem of NYCHA did not start January 1st, 2022. Let's be clear on that. NYCHA has been eroding for decades, and we came in and made sure that, number one, we put it at the top of our agenda, and number two, we're taking real steps. Don't dismiss what NYCHA Land Trust is going to do. Let's not dismiss what we have been doing on the ground. NYCHA has an $80 billion dollar capital problem, and it's not going to be fixed in two years and three months. So ask that person who wrote the report, how long has he been there? And did he just discover these problems? Yeah, and I think to clarify, Greg, I think a couple of things that you said are, are incorrect. One, Bart uh, worked closely with us during the transition. Uh, we had a, actually a good working relationship with him in terms of him raising some of the issues. The chair, before we came on board, was what you said. It was it was a paid person who was both the chair and the CEO. Well, don't cut off. Don't cut off one at a time. We don't cut you. We don't cut you off. Don't cut my staff off. One at a time. One at a time. That's how we do it here. Greg Russ was the chair of NYCHA and he was a paid employee of NYCHA, right? And the CEO. So as part of the transformation plan, which the monitor was engaged in, in the development of that plan, those two roles were split. So you actually have a CEO like you normally have and a chair and a, a volunteer board. So that that's actually what happened. And that was actually in accordance with many of the things that, and I read the report, um, and I, it said a lot of positive things about what this administration has done in the two years and two months that we've been there to move NYCHA forward. So we can follow up with details, but those are the facts. Can you go back for a moment? Can you go back for a moment though? Because that was not mentioned by him. Mm -hmm. In the report, what did it say about this administration? It, well, there are many things, but we'll we'll circle back with some some okay. details. But he didn't acknowledge some of the positive things that we've done. No. Why? Deputy Mayor, Deputy, first Deputy Mayor Wright is the person that is under her um, uh, preview and portfolio. If you want to speak with her later and get her thoughts on it, I value her thoughts on it and she will share what her thoughts are. I've, she's extremely competent, and I trust her vision on these items because she's very familiar, not only as a professional, but her family attachment to NYCHA. Some of us have skin in this game, and we're committed to it because we know what NYCHA has been a failure for years. And so to give the impression that that failure started January 1st, 2022, is an improper Im impression. That's what you, that's the impression that those out there who's watching you say this believe. NYCHA has been a failure. We are correcting the failure, and it's not going to be correct two years and three months, but we've taken major steps, and we're gonna continue to do so, major bold steps. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about um, the folks uh, dealing with mental health issues or acting erratically on the subway? Um, what more can the city or others do to address that, and just how much of a concern is it for you? Well, I think um, Deputy Mayor Williams Ison has pointed to some of the things that we're doing, that we're doing, and we're going to really go on a, a situational awareness campaign because we want to empower New Yorkers and not make them feel helpless. 
And sometimes, you know, just something as simple as standing back from that, mm. that yellow strip that's on the train track, being aware when trains enter the station who's around you, uh, making sure that, as I stated, uh, our law enforcement officers give folks tips as they're moving about. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a duality, I like to believe, to being safe in the system. And the overwhelming number of New Yorkers um, go to and from their place safe. But those random acts of violence are chilling. No one wants to hear that. Some uh, Deputy Mayor Williams Ison, we spoke this morning, she communicated with me, her 28-year-old son um, was at the 125th Street Station. You know, and that's impactful. You know, you, you know your, your family member at these stations and these actions. And that's why we want to zero in on many prongs. There are many rivers that feed this severe mental health crisis. Things we can do, things we want to educate the passengers on doing, and things our lawmakers can do. Uh, 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 Tiffany's up in Albany pounding away at this piece of legislation to give us the, pow the, the power to, um, you know, particularly those who are dealing with a severe mental health illness. And, you know, some of them are calm, but when they're off their medication, you're dealing with a totally different uh, individual. And I know personally uh, people who have in my orbit that when they, you can tell when they're not taking their medication and how they can become violent to themselves and others. And we need to be there for them. How are you doing? I'm just fine. Um, just if you could answer about recidivism. It's, it's been noted as a common problem in all these, uh, these recent spat of crimes. Um, it, it's always been historically accurate that the uh, the small percentage of uh, small percentage of individuals are responsible for an outside percentage of, of crimes. So what is different now? What is different in 2024, 2023, opposed to maybe years prior? The NYPD has rattled off statistics about these, these years, but they failed to really put it in any perspective. So what is different now in the city than it was a few years ago? And then um, building on the, uh, the, uh, the, the prepaid cards for uh, the asylum seekers, I just wonder, what, what was the... The, the motivation to go through a company and pay them almost $2 million to do this if it, the full contract plays out. Instead of doing something like SNAP benefits, um, which those EBT cards are, cannot be used for anything else, then there, there's zero chance of fraud. So what, what was the motivation for using this company over a program that's already established in New York City? And then you use it, for, it can be used for everybody. In case uh, 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 I, the, one of the deputy mayors will go into the, um, the uh, MOCAFI cards, uh, uh, but What's, there's a couple of things that are different. First of all, we've always had a problem with recidivism with a small number of people. It's always been a problem. And we never really zeroed in on it as much as we should have, uh, but case after case after case. What we're finding now, when you add that with the issues around discovery, where many of these cases, uh, you know, are not being prosecuted. And you guys really, you know, uh, this really should be some deep research on how, the over, how we've overwhelmed our district attorney's offices. Uh, I think many of the judges, their reluctancy of giving people, uh, you know, time inside when they're recidivists. So I think it's just a combination of things that we have, you know, there's a philosophy that's in the city and in the country that we really don't need a criminal justice system, I believe. And, and Mayor, I just want to add to that. In 2023, the administration launched, launched a retail theft task force, and we've made a lot of legislative recommendations. Discovery reform to ensure that more cases are prosecuted, increased penalties for individuals who assaulted retail workers. That was a part of the governor's proposed budget. Um, creating a bump up for petty larceny conviction when there is a prior conviction. The DA's offices like this idea. Creating penalties for uh, selling stolen goods online. And so our task force is, is meeting with retailers, law enforcement, trying to figure out how we can cut back on recidivism in the city every day. Because when, when you look at that, you got, I, I think the number was 575 hundred people who were arrested over 7,000 times for a, a, a petty larceny, for um, a shoplifting. 38 people arrested over 1,100 times. 38 people who assaulted transit workers arrested over 1,100 times. I mean, when you start to look at these numbers, you just clearly see, you see the parallel. Recidivism, 
mental health. 50% of the people who are in Rikers have mental health issues. 18% have severe. There's a real parallel. Now, let's look at what the problems are and say, okay, what policies are we putting in place to address the policies? The laws, the policies, the actions have to fit that, and they're not. They're out of alignment. And, and in answer to your question, the, the, the families do not qualify for SNAP. That is the point. That is, I mean, in, when people are in your care, we have to feed them. We want to make sure that it's done uh, at a, a reasonable cost, at a lower cost. So there actually, there is work that is done that generates uh, the fee that's paid to the vendor. But obviously, the majority of the, the, the food, the, 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 um, the resources are going to families to buy food and baby products, but they do not qualify for SNAP. So that is, that is the very point. So, so the that's correct. That's, in, that's important. That's important. They don't qualify. What's that? One more thing. We still have to feed folks. We were finding that people, some of the food we were serving, people didn't want. The money was not going to the local economy. Now it's going to the bodegas, the supermarkets, the local stores. It's recycling. And any economist would tell you the best plan is recycling money back into the communities that are being impacted by it. So we're, we're placing herks and shelters in communities where residents are saying, you know, this is impacting our community. You know, how do we get help here? Hey, we're going to be buying from your local stores so you could hire locally and so that you could help build your local economy. And we're charging less, 13, I think it's $13 a day of, that we're for, for, for folks to eat. T that 10% of food waste, we should see that 10% just dis disappear. And so it may sound like, okay, what are you guys are doing? But when you dig into the numbers, you see that we are in alignment with that 30% cut investing locally, MWBE, having fools waste uh, disappear, we are in alignment with that. And now, the, the only sit, thing... We can sit back and say, well, you know, people going to beat us up for us. People beat us up anyway. <laughs> you, know what I'm you know So we got to do what's right. <laughs> so the only thing I want to add is I think that's the importance of it being a pilot so that we can take a look at it after six weeks and see what's working and what's not. It's my understanding that we will be able to see if people try to abuse it and we can stop the card. It's my understanding that if you try to use it for something other than baby, for food and baby supplies, we can take a look at it too. I mean, I know government is not innovative, but I think this was an innovative way to kind of deal with a challenge. And if it doesn't work, then we'll try something else. And it can only be used at bodega, supermarkets, markets can't be used at other places. That is my understanding. We'll take six weeks, and if people are doing things that are improper, then we'll we'll catch it. To. We'll try. And, there's, and, and there are safeguards in place. And again, just to the mayor's point, the alternative was we were spending a lot more money for a company outside of New York to provide food that people didn't want, uh, no benefit to the local economy, food waste, more expensive. Uh, so this is this kind of is, smart. and I and I would say you know government is innovative. <laughs> we, well, well, I don't think people think we are, I know. Right. but I like to try that's something, right. and then if it doesn't work, then we can do something that's different. That's right, and that's the you know what that's the that's, that was one of the biggest things that we faced in this administration. I remember when we sat down as a team, you know, everybody, you know, I wanted it clear to the team, we are not staying on safe ground, folks. Safe ground got us here. <laughs> you know, uh, afraid to talk about encampments, afraid to talk about guns on our streets, afraid to talk about recidivism, afraid to talk about mental. severe mental health. Everybody was just so afraid. And, you know, well, you know what? If we do this, they're going to write bad stories about us. They're going to criticize us. The advocates are going to boo us. Yeah, well, listen, I've been booed so much, I think my name is Boo. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be bold enough to face these historical challenges that have been in the city for a long time, you know? And, you know, sometimes we're going to drop the ball. Sometimes we're going to learn something. Sometimes we're going to have to do it differently, as, as Ann just pointed out. Sometimes we're going to say, wait a minute, let's, let's tweak this. But we will be damned if we're not going to try. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? <coughs> Good, how are you? Mm -hmm. Um, so this morning, a female cop was punched in the face um, at the 125th st station trying to enforce fares. Um, that station has a history of incidents, like you were mentioning. Is there anything that can be done to maybe make that station safer? And then also, earlier in this press conference, you said, quote, criminals are emboldened. They are not afraid of cops. 
while at the same time you also said, quote, this is not a city out of control. How do you make that latter statement true when you have people who are uh, not afraid of cops? And how do you make people feel safer? And, and I love your question. I'm so glad you brought up that uh, punch in the face. You know, because they are emboldened and because we're taking actions, our city is not out of control. The numbers show that. You know, shootings are down, homicides are down. That's not what I inherited. Uh, you know, every year since I've been mayor, we have a decrease in, in, in subway crime, every year. You know, so now if you want to go back to 2019, like some folks are doing, you know, then that's fine. But right now, every year that I've been mayor, crime has dropped in the subway system. We inherited a 40% increase in crime back January 1st, 2020, 2022. You're seeing crime decrease. So because we are taking action, you're seeing a city not out of control. And the, when those random acts of violence, one of the big three, we need to give it a name, uh, uh, Fabian, one of the big three, random acts of violence, it plays on the psyches of people. Like I heard uh, my good friend from Junior say the other day that, you know, crime is surging out of control. Um, uh, migrants are everywhere. i like, where did you get that talking point from? Because the talking point is not meet, meeting the facts. You know, so people have embraced a talking point because of the random acts of violence. Subway crime is down 5.6% since the administration took office. But when I speak to those people who are on the train, they say, you must have at least three to 400 crimes a day because that's what we're feeling and seeing. That is what the random acts of violence will do to you. And so when you have a person punch a police officer in uniform in their face, it's because they have reached a point that they no longer respect the uniform. There's a pocket of people, not everyday New Yorkers, because the average New Yorker is happy to see an officer and respect the police officer. But those emboldened few are creating that atmosphere. And you see these assaults increasing on police officers, assaults increasing on transit employees. Uh, those are the types of actions that we want to send a loud message. So I went to 125th Street and Lexington Avenue uh, last year, and I stood there. Uh, for about an hour, an hour and a half. Now, I'm there with uniform officers. We're all standing there doing observation. I wanted to see what was happening. Around that whole area was disgusting. No lights. It was dirty. They were doing construction for years. I don't even know if they know what the construction project was anymore. And so we sat there. People were walking through the gate, hopping the turnstile. They were saying, it, it was like the police weren't even there. You know why? Because we broadcast, we're no longer going to um, prosecute fair evasions. So little J uh, Johnny, the banker, reads that and says, why am I paying my fare? <laughs> we stopped that. And you're going to see a complete turnaround at that station because now we're doing real enforcement again in our system. I told the police department, it is not my job to determine what is prosecuted. It's my job to make sure we apprehend those who commit the crime. We're not going to respond to what judges do and what others do. We're going to, if the crime happens, we're going to do our job and let others determine what they do in that criminal justice system. That's why that officer was punched in, in her face. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This conversation, let the system do the job. Give me those two pictures from Burger King. And this is Burger King. Let me share what happened here that it, it was written about. I got a call about what was happening on the street down the block from uh, on Fulton Street. And I called the precinct, and I stated to them, what's going on there? Are we allowing people to sell drugs uh, um, at Burger King, in front of Burger King? The precinct commander told me we did undercover operations, we did buy and bust, we wanted to determine um, is drug activity. He says, Eric, these guys are not selling drugs. These guys have come from all over the city, and for whatever reason, they feel this is a place they could come and not be treated unfairly. These are homeless people from all over the city that feel as though they needed a place just to come together, like other groups do, like people sit on the steps of museums and the library, and they call us. 
I'm sure if these guys all had dogs standing around at a dog clutch, no one would have said, what are they doing there? But their mere presence gave the impression that they're all criminals. So I did something revolutionary. I went to talk to them and said, who are you? Why are you homeless? How did it happen? How did you get on this pathway? And what can I do as a mayor to help you to get both stabilized and get your lives in order and not just see you and just say the mere fact that you dress that way and look that way, that you are criminals. They're not criminals. They're people who have fallen on hard times, who, when they stand in front and like have that cup and say, can I give you something? You know what I thought about? When I was a little boy standing in front of A&P and people shoppers came out and I would ask, ma'am, can I help you put your bag in the car so I can get enough money to help mommy to pay to get food on our table? That's what I thought about. I see them, I see myself. Let me show you that other picture. Here's where I was this morning. That's the guy with that tie on in the background. You know what I, where I am? I'm on Rikers Island. These young men here recommitted their lives to God. These young men said that we never thought we would get a mayor that would come and be here with us. They're praying for our city. They're praying for each other. They're praying for me. I hope they're praying for me too. Don't leave me alone. That's right. That's who I am. God placed love in my heart. And if it means talking to homeless people at Burger King, or if it means going to Rikers Island and talking to inmates, I am them. I am them. And no other mayor ever has been able to say that.